Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. For this lesson, we're going to be talking about neuroplasticity. So what is neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to change throughout your life. So this would be the making and breaking of the synaptic connections between neurons. The changes can be caused by both genetic and environmental factors. So the two types of neuroplasticity that we will be talking about are the synaptic plasticity and cortical remapping. Synaptic plasticity is the smallest scale. This could be in a single neuron. And it also depends on neuron activity. So synaptic plasticity is the breaking of old synaptic connections and the forming of new synaptic connections. In the book, it included these two phrases, neurons that fire together, wire together, and neurons that fire out of sync, fail to link. This explains that if two nearby neurons are more active at the same time, a synaptic connection between them may gradually form. And if two connections aren't activated together that much, the connection may gradually fall apart. Then next we have cortical remapping, which is the largest scale of neuroplasticity. This is when a brain area assumes the function of another brain area. So brain X takes brain Y's function. So one study on neuroplasticity on the level of cortical remapping was done by Merzenich. I don't know if I was I'm saying that right, but this could be found in your book as well. This is when researchers studied the hand of eight adult monkeys. They severed some of their fingers and observed if the function would be relocated to some to the other fingers or it would just stay in the stump of the finger. So in this case, they severed the middle finger. Af after 62 days, they saw how the remapping was done, and it was seen that the cortical area responsible for that finger rewired to the adjacent fingers to increase sensitivity on those. So neuroplasticity could also be linked as a mechanism of learning. So this is when learning occurs, the brain reshapes in order to accommodate the new information. Um, a study related to this could, would be Dragonski et al. 2004. This study's aim was to see whether the human brain could really change in response to environmental changes. So the sample was split into two groups jugglers and non-jugglers. All of the participants had no knowledge of juggling. The juggler group was tasked to learn a routine in three months. After three months, they took a break for another three months. And the non-jugglers, which was the control, just lived their normal lives within the same time. The brain scans were done before learning how to juggle, after learning how to juggle, and finally, after the break from learning how to juggle. The second scan showed more gray matter in the mid-temporal area. Known, and this area is known as being associated to coordination of movement. A correlation was also seen in the results. The more you practice, the more change in brain structure. And as you learn more, brain areas get bigger, and when learning stops, brain areas shrink, but not to the initial size. It was seen that those who trained more had a bigger gray matter. Practical applications. So having your brain rewire as an adaptation to changes could be really helpful for your everyday life. So these are some examples of applications of neuroplasticity. 
sense substitution. This is the idea of other senses making up for a loss of another sense. So this could be typically seen with blind people as they develop great, um, heightened senses in order to make up for their loss of sight. Human echolocation has the same concept with bats. Some blind people could be able to see around them through echoes. They would produce clicking sounds and analyze the echoes that bounce off the objects around them. They would use this to locate the objects in the room and to navigate their way around. Another is the Bach et al. 1969. I'm not sure if I said that right. But this was about an invention that they did and the testing of it. So this was a chair to allow blind people to see. The chair was attached to a big camera that captures the room and converts it into electrical signals. Then this signal sends vibrations to the chair. Blind people were able to gradually learn and recognize visual stimuli through the vibrations in the chair. So both of these are examples of neuroplasticity applications to blind people. Then another briefly mentioned idea in the book was the brain-machine interfaces. These are artificial sensory organs and bionic limbs that can be controlled through thought. So that is it for Unit 2, Lesson 2, Neuroplasticity. We hope to see you soon on our next video.